Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us for this, this session. Building braver cultures means understanding our starting point and working collectively to develop forward. I'm Grace Grant, Executive Director of Gamma Iota Sigma, which is a professional student organization serving a mission of promoting and sustaining student interest in the insurance industry. With 100 collegiate chapters and thousands of student members across the country, Gamma Iota Sigma is uniquely positioned to discuss how the next generation is approaching authenticity in the workplace. We are pleased to partner with Dive In to discuss, celebrate, and take action on the importance of creating spaces that allow all people to feel safe, valued, and respected. Who better to drive that change and this conversation than our Gamma Iota Sigma student members and recent alumni? We will host a live Q&A as we finish up the panel, but please feel free to use the Q&A function to submit questions as you think of them throughout the session. We appreciate you joining us on this important discussion. Let's hear from our Gen Z panel. When I was asked to moderate this panel on the behalf of GIS, I could not have possibly been more excited to participate. I'm a strong believer in elevating the voices of young talent and that elevating those voices will be key to finding solutions to the diversity and talent issues that the industry is facing. Gamma Iota Sigma is the premier talent pipeline for the insurance industry, connecting thousands of students across 100 colleges and universities who are interested in pursuing careers in the insurance industry. Because of how many students our organization connects, we have a unique perspective on the future of industry diversity. For today's session, we've assembled a panel of four individuals who all have introduced themselves. Akriti, we can start with you. Thank you, Zain and Nikia, for this opportunity. I'm Akriti Band, a recent graduate from ULM, University of Louisiana Monroe Risk Management and Insurance Program. I'm originally from Kathmandu, Nepal, so I'm an international student. I'm currently pursuing Master's of Business Administration degree from the University of Louisiana Monroe. For me, building braver cultures means being open to conversations regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion, and following through with actions. It means giving a platform to express opinions without being judged, giving up biases, and turning a new page. Thank you, Akriti. Bree, do you want to introduce yourself next? Thank you, Zane, and thank you, Nakia, for bringing me into this project. Um, my name is Bree Allen. I am currently a casualty broker and team leader at WCW, formerly known as Willis Towers Watson. I am a graduate of Illinois State University. I was a risk management and insurance uh, major in the Cady School of Insurance. I also was vice president in Gamma Iota, uh, Gamma, Gamma Iota Sigma's Alpha Kappa chapter. Um, DEI has been extremely important for me um, during college, and it's been at the forefront of um, everything I do since I've started working at WTW. It is very important for me uh, to uplift others coming into our organization, as well as um, you know keeping in mind that this is uh, an issue that I face every day. So very excited to um, to participate in this panel. Thank you so much, Bri. We're, we're happy to have you on the panel. David, could you introduce yourself next? Thank you very much. My name is David King Agbi. Um, I'm from Ghana, West Africa, where I did my bachelor's in actuarial science. Currently, I'm pursuing my master's degree in quantitative risk analysis and management at Georgia State University, and I'm the graduate student representative for GIS here. Thank you. Thank you, David. And then to finish this off, Philman, could you introduce yourself? Thank you, Zane. Hey, my name is Philman Futsum, and I'm a senior at East Carolina University, uh, currently pursuing two degrees in human resources and risk management insurance. Um, currently, right now, I'm the DNI chapter representative for East Carolina University, the Beta Theta chapter, and also working as uh, Gamma said chair within Gamma's grant chapter and student advisory council as well. I'm a first generation college student and also a second, second generation um, American. So, DNI is obviously something that's very important to me. Thank you, Zane. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Philmon. And thank you to all of you for joining us today for this panel discussion. Uh, I'm sure as all of you can tell from those introductions, we have an all-star group of students and young professionals representing a very wide spectrum of experiences within the insurance industry and in the DEI space. 
Uh, we're very excited to share our perspectives with you, so we'll jump right into the conversation. Uh, for our first question, I'll pose it to Philmon. Philmon, I'm curious, based on your own experience, how would you rate the insurance industry's practice of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, so this summer I had the opportunity to intern with Markel through WSIA Diversity Foundation, and it was my first time working in a professional setting, so it was a little nerve-wracking and didn't know what to expect. Uh, but throughout the summer, everybody was very welcoming, and I was get I got to see all the DNI practice they had in place for all their ERGs, and they ha- they held weekly uh, meetings throughout the summer where they were able to connect throughout each office around the world and kind of got to build allyship and got to be able to see why it's very important for them to keep those meetings going. Yeah, that, that's great to hear. It's really refreshing to hear an example of how the industry is really positively practicing uh, the way that it approaches DEI, especially with structured programs like the WSA Diversity Foundations Internship Program that you were able to go through. Uh, Akriti, I would also be interested to hear your thoughts on the same question. Based on your experience, how would you rate the insurance industry's practice of diversity, equity, and inclusion? So my experience about insurance industry's practice of diversity, equity, and inclusion as an international student has mainly been a negative one. It has been extremely difficult to find internships or jobs. Typically, employers are not willing to sponsor work visas beyond OPT, so they do not want to hire an international student because there is a chance that the candidate might not be able to work with them for a long period of time. It has also been very difficult to even land job interviews, even when insurance industry is hiring in such a huge scale. Um, I always make it clear in my applications and my resume that I would need a visa sponsorship. So if for a chance I was able to secure a job interview, it would immediately get cut whenever I would bring up a question about visa sponsorship. On the other hand, in a workplace setting, oftentimes I get treated differently because I'm an international student who was brought up in a different cultural environment. I get asked questions about my ethnicity, which are inappropriate for workplace. And I also meet people um, who associate me with their preconceived notions about my culture and my ethnicity and try to put me in a box which um, does not give me a chance to express my individual identity. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that, Akriti. I think it's really important to acknowledge the gaps in our diversity and inclusion practice uh, and opportunities for employers to make improvements uh, to continue to recruit top talent. Uh, I really like that you brought up how many jobs the industry is hiring for. I think that we constantly hear about how there's in some cases more jobs than there's even candidates for. So it's it's frustrating to see that there's still areas of the industry and areas within recruiting where despite the number of jobs, there's still very, very high hurdles for international students and other uh, underserved populations in the industry to even get in that door when there's so many opportunities that that companies could be recruiting these students into. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. And I, I think it's really important for us to get that message out there and bring awareness to the difficulty that international students face uh, in this process. Building from there, I'll, I'll kick it to David. David, do you have any thoughts on the ways that insurance companies can, can change their practices and prioritize diversity and equi- equity and inclusion? Yes. So um, to me, diversity, equity, and inclusion has brought positivity and transformation to the area of insurance, especially in terms of um, dealing with clients, stakeholders, and industry team players. So to encourage the prioritization of DEI, there would have to be a conscious effort to embrace and accept people of different backgrounds, physical and mental capabilities, genders, social standing, expertise, and opinions in order to make them feel belong. So in order to um, achieve this, some initiatives that I think can be taken by insurance policy stakeholders are organizing training and mentoring program for maybe the disabled on how to own and grow businesses as well as diversify risk. So using such platforms would encourage them to sign up for health insurance and other policies that would be beneficial to them. This will give them a sense of awareness of the importance of insurance and make them feel well catered for by the insurance, by the insurance industry. Um, also encouraging good interpersonal relationships between senior leaders and subordinates. 
instilling respect, friendliness, practicing good morals, and teaching um, workers to complement each other's strengths and weaknesses. Also, leadership role, leadership role focused on DEI. I think leaders should be leaders are responsible for um, shifting the mindsets and behaviors of their followers. So top level managers and executive leaders are very influential to board members, other managers and employees. There will be a high advocacy for diversity, equity and inclusion once executive leaders decide to fight for this cause. And then stripping biases and preferential treatment of candidates at an interview, clients and even employees are a solid way of promoting DEI at the workplace. Furthermore, diversity in their senior leadership. When employees feel well re represented and significant, they do their best to keep the company thriving. So leaders should therefore not consist of one classification of persons, example, maybe all males or all elderly people and so on. Also, there should, be there should be intentional employment of more females in insurance companies to increase women participation and allowing for their promotion once qualified for the position. So followers watch closely and emulate actions and decisions of senior leaders. So ensuring DEI in the workforce will instill a sense of respect and acceptance. So ensuring DEI will have a positive impact on the entire company from top to bottom. Last but not the least, creation of employee resource groups, which is just ERGs. I think they are voluntary associations that create a safe space for people that share an identity and helps them to feel connected to each other. So employees' interests should be measured in order to ensure that groups formed promote a worthwhile cause while in alignment with the company's vision. Increase in educational opportunities for employees. There is no doubt that the more skilled and knowledgeable people that the workforce is, the more productive the company will be. So in order to tap into the full potential of employees, DEI practices such as supporting their professional development, despite their existing level of education must be implemented. Also work, workplace flexibility should be offered for those who take part-time courses if the organization can afford to do so. Sponsorships and scholarships may be offered to deserving members who need aid and trainers or mentors should be provided to all employees, irrespective of their race, gender, or age. And then consideration of international candidates. Employing a diverse team increases the innovation and problem-solving capacity of the firm. Recruiting talents from different backgrounds makes hiring more inclusive and leads to better results. Hires and future colleagues of, in, of international candidates must be aware of behavioral, physical, and cultural, social um, differences and should endeavor to treat people with the needed respect and solidarity in order to make them feel welcome. So all forms of racial or gender discrimination, especially, should be avoided. An, an organization can show their commitment to diverse and inclusive hiring by considering inclusive job postings tweaking benefits to suit the needs of foreigners, including the interest in DEI in your mission or vision, and must be willing to accept the new talent pool, regardless of differences. Thank you. Thank you so much for that response, David. I think that you really hit the nail on the head with a lot of those suggestions that you made. Uh, one of them that you mentioned that I personally think is particularly important is having a member of senior leadership solely dedicated to diversity, equity, and inclusion within the organization. And I think that we've seen this happen in a lot of major insurance uh, companies across the industry, uh, but it's not happening enough, right? We don't see uh, enough of these large insurance companies adding these roles into their, into their senior leadership team. And kind of a caveat along with that, I think that it's also important to note that you can add a senior leader who's dedicated to diversity and inclusion, but you really still have to create that culture through all levels of the organization, like you mentioned. So that, that diversity and inclusion senior leader can't be the one person who's solely responsible for building a diverse and inclusive organization. You really have to get all of your managers on board and your leadership from top down to create a culture that kind of permeates through the entire organization rather than just a top level emphasis on diversity, because that is not going to, not going to ever be enough. Um, I think that one of the important themes that you brought up in, in what you were saying is creating that allyship within DEI practices. Bree, you're working full-time right now. Do you have any thoughts on ways that professionals 
who do not identify as minorities can join this conversation and support DEI initiatives? Absolutely. Um, this has absolutely been something that I have been, um, you know, very involved with at my organization for the past few years. Um, WCW has done a great job um, in the past two years or so with creating a ton of DEI initiatives for all types of people, you know, very specific programs, very specific initiatives um, that have been panning out very well. However, one issue that I feel like we do have is that sometimes people who do not identify um, in that specific minority group, they don't know how to get involved. Um, you know, they don't know how they can support. They don't know if it's appropriate to do so. Um, I absolutely believe that it is imperative to have, um, you know, individuals who are not a part of that group to, um, you know, to, to get involved, to assist. I think that I have found um, that whatever initiatives we're trying to push, whatever we're doing, when we have um, individuals with more of a voice, we're able to get things um, done a lot quicker. Um, so one of the things that um, I think is really important, and I think David is something you hit on, is those resource groups, right? So uh, at my organization, we have a ton of networks. We have multicultural networks. Um, we have um, LGBTQ plus networks. We have uh, gender um, equity networks. We have all of those different types of things. Um, and I think it is very important for um, individuals who do not identify with those groups to um, be comfortable with joining groups that is not about them. You know, sometimes I feel like um, you don't feel like you can have much of an impact by joining those. But for example, I don't identify, um, you know, with uh, the LGBTQ plus community. However, I make sure that I am involved with their activities, with their groups, um, you know, trying to create that safe space where I know that my voice um, can assist in some of the things that they're trying to do. I think it's really important to come to those meetings. It's important to figure out what exactly you can do um, to assist in any way. Um, another thing that I think is really important um, is having those difficult conversations, right? understanding what it is that people identify in different minority groups need from you as an ally. Um, when I first started, one thing that I really wanted was uh, compensation transparency. I was very concerned um, with not, you know, receiving my fair share of pay or whatever it may be in comparison to some of my um, counterparts that, you know, do not identify in the same way that I do. And I received that. I had a few individuals who were comfortable enough with, um, you know, making sure that, you know, we were on the same page, we were on the same level. And I think that sometimes you don't want to hear that you have a certain amount of privilege over under individuals. Um, but sometimes that's important. If you want to be an ally, you have to have those difficult conversations and understand where we're coming from with, you know, different things. Um, Another thing um, that I will say, you know, that is very important, I think, on, on our end um, from a leadership standpoint is understanding how to, and I guess not just a leadership standpoint in general, understanding how to work and lead people who do not look like you. Um, you know, I'm from the south side of Chicago. Very few of us in our office are, are from that. I have almost nothing in common, you know, with, uh, with many individuals. And um, I've had to really, it's been an uphill battle trying to figure out, you know, how do I connect with these people who are nothing like me? Um, I've been luckily, lucky enough to get mentors who have made a point um, to connect. So I think it's very important to, you know, individuals like you guys who are coming into the workforce to take on mentorship opportunities, take on sponsorship opportunities. Um, that way when opportunities arise, you have someone you know, in your corner who will put you up for these different opportunities. So I think the, the bigger message for me is it's gonna be uncomfortable to be an ally. You know, it's, it's uncomfortable, but you have to take that plunge and um, be okay with being a bit uncomfortable. So that way we can see some type of change. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think you shared some really great takeaways, both for senior leaders who are looking to structure their diversity approach within their organization, but also for just listeners in the audience who are looking to personally expand their allyship. Throughout all the things that we have discussed so far during this session, I think that one of the largest things I have personally taken away, uh, just like Bree just said, is that these conversations don't come easily. These are difficult conversations to have, but they're necessary conversations to have. 
Um, and the theme of the Dive In Festival this year, I think, speaks beautifully to this. We have to act boldly and bravely to change the culture and the practices of our industry and build a better future for our generation here in this panel uh, and just for the industry as a whole. So to really wrap up our conversation, I want to pose one question to all four of you and get each of your thoughts on it. Uh, we can start with Philmon. So what is one thing that insurance companies can do to build braver cultures? Yeah, so one thing that you guys mentioned would be um, executive sponsorships. So being able to attach themselves to, let's just say, one ERG and being able to work with them closely and to figure out what they need and how they can help them be successful within the workplace to where they feel that um, it's a good place for them to work and also that um, their needs are being filled and everything along those lines. So, yeah. Thank you, Philmon. Brianna, what is one thing that you can say for insurance companies to build braver cultures? Um, I think a, a, a big key to that is empowering um, employees to be able to, to speak up um, and give feedback on, you know, opportunities that they think to make things better. Um, I am one of the few individuals, I think, um, in our age group, I've been at WCW for five years now, which is pretty long now. You know, at this point, people are on their second, third company. Um, and, and one reason that I felt so comfortable with being where I am is that my leadership has um, made a point to be able to allow me to speak up um, when I think things are going left. Um, and they've been able to implement some of the things that I gave feedback on and, and talked about. So I think that making sure that um, minorities are not afraid um, to speak up is, is very, very important. Thank you for sharing that, Brie. It's great to hear about that environment that you've been able to feel comfortable in uh, during your time with WTW. It's good to hear those, those success stories on DEI within the industry. David, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the same question. What is one thing that insurance companies can do to build braver cultures? Okay, so um, to buttress what Brie just said, I think encouraging bravery or fortitude. I believe bravery is, is, is a trait that can be learned, okay? So there is this statement I heard in a podcast I listened to, which said, um, is the things that you hate that you won't do? And the same thing that you hate that needs to be done. So what are you going to do? Same applies to fear in this situation. That's encouraging people to leave their comfort zone, increases their confidence to step further outside it more often. This in indicates that you see and acknowledge risks as key to long-term success, even when they don't pay off in the short term. Think about, think about the revolution and talents that could be developed in the industry if everyone in it had the bravery to speak truthfully and freely to, to try new approaches, right? People will know their bosses support and encourage them will be far more willing and bolder to go the extra mile to exchange what has been working for what might even work better. Thank you. I love the way you put that, David. It's, you can't make change without being uncomfortable. So just like you said, you have to have bravery, have fortitude to kind of push for this change that we absolutely need within the industry. So being able to be brave, have fortitude and embrace that comfort head on because that comfort is what change is born out of. Akriti, to round us off, what do you think? What is one thing that insurance companies can do to build braver cultures? Suzanne, like you mentioned earlier, there are some companies which are taking a lot of efforts to ensure diversity, equity, and inclusion in workplace, while there are some others which are not taking things at the same level. So efforts regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion are not easy. You'll often get setbacks, you'll often get pushbacks. So for me, building braver cultures require not giving up on those efforts. It means accepting that it's better late than never. So companies need to start um, making efforts to make diversity, equity, and inclusion happen in workplace and to not give up on those. Yeah, 100%. I, I, I definitely resonate with what you said. It's better to start late than never, right? I, I, I agree with you. I think that it's, we're starting this push late. We should have been pushing diversity in the industry for a very, very long time now, but it's time that we address it. And it's time that across the industry, uh, we push forward to address the very large issues that the industry is facing from a talent and diversity perspective. Um, I just want to thank all four of you for joining us for this panel discussion today. I, Like I said at the beginning, I think it is so very important to elevate the voices of students and young professionals in this industry. I, I think one important thing to talk about when we're talking about DEI initiatives in the industry is that 
as much as we want it to be a quick fix, it's not a quick fix. We're investing in these DEI initiatives now. So decades down the line, we can finally have the diverse industry that, that we deserve to have, and the industry will be much better for that. And so this is not an immediate process. It's a long and ongoing process, and it is really, really directly impacting our generation, right? We're just entering the industry right now, but 30 years down the line, it's going to be us who are the senior leaders in these roles. It's going to be people who are who are graduating with us right now and entering the industry. And so for listeners in the audience, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to come listen to our perspective and listen to the young professional and student perspective on these topics. And also as a call, call to action for anyone who's listening in the audience, continue to elevate young voices into these conversations as you have young professionals that enter your organization passionate about DEI initiatives, include them in these conversations, include them in your DEI councils, because it truly is the professionals who are entering now that this is going to impact the most down the line. So continue to elevate those young voices, continue to be bold, continue to be brave and embrace the uncomfort that comes along with change because getting through that temporary uncomfort of change within the organization will just make your organization that much more diverse and that much more higher functioning down the road. So again, thank you so much to our panel for sharing your perspectives. I know it takes a lot of vulnerability to speak about these issues. And thank you to the diving community for caring about our stories. We truly hope that this has been informative and thank you all for the opportunity to let us share our thoughts on diversity and inclusion within the insurance industry. Philmon and Akriti, thank you so much for, for joining me today to do a live Q&A after that session. Thanks for having us. So we're gonna, yeah, of course. We're gonna spend uh, about the next 30 minutes taking some live Q&A from the audience. Uh, so I think we'll get some questions up here on the screen in a little bit. <clears throat> so Philmon, I'll pose the first question to you, I'm curious. From your perspective as a student looking out in the job market, what are current job seekers looking for in relation to diversity, equity, and inclusion? And how can employers illustrate their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion to those individuals who are out there in the job market looking for a job within the industry now? Yeah, 100%. So I would say as a job seeker myself uh, looking for work at the end of uh, graduation, um, one of the things that I'm looking for is um, a clear DNI initiative that the company has in stone that they're looking to achieve within the next few years. And then also having um, ERGs where they can have people get involved, whether it be for their age um, or any other diverse ways they can get involved within the company. Yeah, for sure. Uh, sharing my experience as well. Um, I'm going to be going into the industry full time after graduating in May. And for me, when I was looking through that, it was just what you mentioned, Philmon. It was being able to see demonstrated programs within the company that are demonstrating their commitment to diversity, but it was also being able to have conversations about diversity and inclusion with people who are already in the organization. So people outside of the interview team giving candidates access to maybe other young professionals who have recently entered the organization from diverse backgrounds to be able to get their take on what the diversity experience is within that organization as well. Really understanding kind of that full picture of what the experience would be like in that role is a great way to, to help a new candidate understand your, your organization's commitment to diversity and inclusion. So jumping to a next question, uh, Akri, I'll, I'll pose this one to you. What would be an appropriate way to learn from the experiences of others in the workplace, other people with diverse backgrounds? What's the, what's the appropriate way to approach that? Um, I would really say that depends on a person to person basis, because what could be appropriate for me might not be appropriate to someone else. Um, for me personally, I like to have conversations in a straightforward manner. Like if my behavior has affected you in certain way, I would like for you to come and talk to me just so that we can clear out any confusions that we might have. Uh, but also realize the fact that when you're having such conversations, go into those conversations with an open mind because you might have a different perception about something and the reality could be completely different. Yeah, for sure. I really, I really like a perspective. And I think that those, those open lines of communication are really, really important for, 
understanding the experience of others in, in the workplace because everyone's experience is different and, and is diverse. Uh, Phil Mom, do you have any thoughts on that, on how to best approach understanding other people's experiences in the workplace? Yeah, I would just say, um, being honest, like she said, and um, showing your true intentions and how you actually want to learn about their culture or what makes them different. Got it. So kind of keeping along that same line, uh, we got another question that's a little bit similar to the one that we just answered, but gives it a little bit of a different twist. So I'll pose this one to both of you as well. We can start with Philmon. What is your personal favorite way to connect with others that are different from yourself? Yeah, that's a very good question. I would say um, finding everybody's different, but usually there should be some common interest that both you have. So whether that be um, within insurance and just starting small conversations from there and then um, building that up to where you could speak about personal experiences. And yeah, for for example, um, over the summer with my internship at Markel, um, I was a first generation college student, my first time working in an office setting. So really didn't have anything in common with everybody there, but um, we connected on sports and just kind of built it up from there. And they learn about myself and what makes me different from them. Yeah, Akriti, I know you touched on this a little bit in your last answer, but for you, what's your personal favorite way to get to know about other people's backgrounds? Um, I absolutely agree with Philmon, um, trying to find some common interests that individuals might have, because that would be a very great point to start a conversation in. Uh, but with that being said, there are also times when that might not really, there might not really be a basis for commonality between people uh, so talking more in a workplace environment, I would encourage team building activities and uh, try to introduce different activities and not stick to the same ones that we have been doing for years again and again. Um, and that way you might find something new to connect to different people, which you might not have thought about before. For sure. I also think uh, throwing it back to the session to Bree's answer in the session, I think she touched on something um, a little bit similar to this as well when uh, approaching learning about other people. For companies that have established ERGs or employee resource groups, she mentioned how she tries to stay intentionally involved even in ERGs that she doesn't directly fall into that category that the ERG caters to. And I think that that's an amazing uh, a way as well. I spent my summer interning at Munich Re and uh, their ERGs, they had tons of different ERGs for different groups. And those ERGs would sometimes put on events that were open to the entire company, informative and educational events um, about different struggles or different experiences that the individuals within that ERG face. So I think that's another great way as well to learn about other people's experiences and backgrounds is to, to stay involved and to go to the events that are being put on by diverse groups uh, or employee resource groups within your organization. Um, so posing the next question, uh, how would you approach an interview or a potential employer sponsorship when you want to know about their DEI initiative? So as someone interviewing, how would you go about asking about their DEI initiatives? Yeah, so for me, I would ask um, the numbers of um, if it's available um, of what diverse candidates they already have within the workforce for their company. And then um, in what ways are lacking and how they're trying to uh, work upon that. So um, let's just say that they want to get more women leadership roles and how they would do that. I would like to see a plan of action and see in which ways they're trying to attack that. Yeah, for sure. Akriti, how would you, how would you go about approaching that in an interview process? Um, for me, typically, if I'm taking an interview um, with any company, we obviously like going to the website and knowing what the company is about. And in those companies, I typically also look at the page of leadership and history to how the company has been evolving. So, you know, if you through the history and leadership, you can tell a lot about a company's culture and what they believe in. Um, also, like Philmont said, I ask those questions during an interview about the initiatives they're taking. And if there are any employee resource groups, because that's also a very strong commitment that a company can show towards um, diversity, equity, and inclusion within the organization. Yeah, Akriti, I love that you mentioned looking at the history of the organization. I think that's 
a, a really powerful suggestion because if you can see a historical dis, like demonstrated pattern of an organization having a strong commitment to diversity, that history and that evidence, kind of those empirics of commitment to diversity and inclusion speaks so much louder than just words of a commitment. So being able to see that demonstrated history as well, I think is a really powerful way for us as candidates to know that there is a strong commitment to diversity and inclusion within any organization that we're, we're learning about or interviewing with. Uh, this next question, I'm gonna pose it to myself and then I'll kick it to Akriti and Philemon because I love this question. How can we increase the pipeline of students interested in insurance careers? I think this is the golden question. Uh, we hear all the time about how many retirees uh, we're gonna have in the, in the next decade or so within the industry and how many spots that we're gonna need to fill within the industry. So the golden question is, how do we get more students in? How do we fill those spots? And so being involved with uh, Gamma Iota Sigma, with Gamma Iota Sigma's diversity initiatives, as well as being involved with Gamma Iota Sigma, it, with the grand chapter kind of helping coordinate with all of our collegiate chapters. This is a question that I grapple with a lot as a leader on, within my own chapter and a leader within the grand chapter as well. And I think that it's really, the answer to it is just continued investment in students, whether that be support of organizations like Gamma Iota Sigma or the Spencer Educational Foundation that are giving direct support to students that are looking to, to study in insurance, or whether that be through your own organization providing uplifting opportunities for students, having really intentionally structured educational um, internship programs that students can access really helps helps get students interested as well. So just really intentional continued investment in students from organizations. Like I said, whether that be support of organizations that already have that infrastructure or building strong training programs within your own organizations. When we feel invested in as students, that's when we pick what industry we want to go into. If, if insurance is demonstrating to college students uh, across the country and across the globe that they are serious about investing in college students, they're serious about investing educational resources and getting these students in the door, that's when students are going to be excited about uh, entering the industry. I even think it goes a little bit farther than that is even investing in high school pipelines. Um, I've, I've seen companies out there that have started to invest in summer um, apprenticeship programs for high schoolers in low income areas. I think that that is a really, really phenomenal way to to tackle the diversity challenges that we're facing in the industry, but also get more students interested in insurance. If you're getting those students in the door all the way when they're in high school before they've even thought about a college education or thought about a career yet, um, you're getting them in the door and you're getting them interested in the industry that much earlier. So I think that all of those things I mentioned uh, are are really great options to continue to get students um, students interested in the industry. And I think that kind of at the core of that, it all centers in a really serious organizational investment in students in whatever way organically makes sense for your organization. Um, I love that question. I'm going to kick it. Philmon as well, if you, if you want to give your thoughts on that question, how can we increase the pipeline of students that are interested in entering this industry? Yeah, I for sure agree with you about getting started early within high school programs. Um, Cause I know for me up until I got into the program at East Carolina University, I have never heard of the ENS side of the market and just thought it was like the state farms, progressives of the insurance world, but early on learned that wasn't the case. And also the one thing that um, led me to choosing risk management insurance was um, East Carolina has a hundred percent placement rate for jobs, which was very attractive for me looking for a job after school. So um, one of the reasons why I chose risk management insurance and once I got in um, very interesting field and, learning a lot. So um, we'd recommend it to anybody. For sure. Akriti, kind of speaking to your experience as a student who has decided that they're interested in this industry, kind of what got you interested in speaking from that experience? What can we draw from that to get more students interested? Um, for me personally, um, like I told in the video earlier, I am from Nepal and insurance is not a very popular concept there. So when I came here and I learned that there was a whole degree in risk management and insurance, I wanted to try it out. Um, also for me personally, it was the fact that insurance is applicable pretty much everywhere in the world, which would mean that I had opportunities for international relocation, um, which was one of the very biggest attractions for me. 
as talking about someone uh, who has worked a lot of recruiting events to get students interested in um, risk management and insurance or just a career in insurance, I think the biggest attraction is uh, the ENS market because a lot of high school students don't know about it. Um, and I think we need to have more promotion of that side of the industry. Yeah, for sure. I think that I think that that promotion um, is really important as well. And so to kind of wrap up our discussion around this question, I'll, I'll tell a quick story that I think uh, really speaks to the need that the industry has for some more marketing to young people. Uh, one of my closest friends who graduated from our risk management program here at St. Mary's University last year, and she's working full time in the industry now. Um, she actually grew up wanting to be an actuary. So she went to school to study actuarial sciences. And uh, when she was a senior in high school, she told her counselor that she was going to go to college to study actuarial sciences. And when she told her counselor that, her counselor got really excited and he said, oh my God, you're going to, she, she was from Nicaragua. She, he said, oh, you're going to go to the States and you're going to be an actor? Because uh, he thought actuarial sciences, she was going to go and she was going to study acting. So it's a funny story. Uh, but I just think, I think that what you said about continuing to promote the industry and get some stronger marketing out there for young people is really important because in a lot of cases, students, and I mean, in that case, even a, a high school college counselor didn't even know about the career opportunities that were available within this line of work. So I think that just continued marketing catered towards young people will really help continue to build that pipeline. Uh, Philmon, I have a question that I think is is really good specific for you with your role leading Gamma Said, the diversity initiative within Gamma Iota Sigma. How has your experience in Gamma Iota Sigma and your experience working with Gamma Iota Sigma's diversity and equity initiatives uh, prepared you for going into the workplace? I think it's been very helpful for me to come out of school. I'll be a leader within the DNI space already personally, just knowing what <clears throat> just knowing what um, what I'll learn throughout this uh, leadership role. Um, I can bring that to any company that I join after school and is learning from different topics because I know um, since joining Gamma Said team, um, I've already learned a lot within um, different ways people can be diverse. So um, it's been just a learning experience so far. Yeah, for sure. I, th I think it's really great that you're, like you said, you're a thought leader in this space already. And so you'll be able to to launch into your career and already have that network and those connections within the diversity advocates within the industry. Um, so I'll pose this question to you first, Akriti. How can employers be intentional in recruiting diverse talent uh, when they're when they're visiting campuses? Um, I think the first way to approach that is visiting campuses, which does have diverse population. Um, for me in University of Louisiana Monroe, which is where I did my undergrad in, um, maybe 90% of our population of RMI students were Caucasian students. And it was only 10% which were people of color. So if you came to a place like that, then I don't think you would have a very diverse pool of candidates to start to hire from in terms of ethnic diversity. So I think first it's defining what kind of diversity you're looking for and then maybe finding appropriate places to go for those. For sure, for sure. I think it's really important that you mention that is not even just diversity on a campus, sometimes it's uh, what campuses are diverse to recruit from. So there's there's historically black college and colleges and universities out there that you can recruit from. There's Hispanic serving institutions um, so even when you're, when you're looking to recruit, looking at what the demographic populations of the students at those universities are is, is really important as well. Because there's some, there's HBCUs and there's Hispanic serving institutions out there with really well-established risk management insurance programs. So being intentional about recruiting from those talent pools, I think is a, a huge step in the right direction. But also when you're recruiting on any campus, even if it's not the most diverse campus ever, just being really intentional to make sure that you're recruiting in a diverse way, you're talking to everyone at those career fairs and that your, your recruitment materials are accessible, I think is important as well. Philmon, do you have any, any thoughts on diverse recruiting on campus? Yeah, so I know at East Carolina University, we have large organizations on campus that serve diverse groups. For example, we have the Black Student Union and um, most students that come in there are usually um, freshmen, sophomore, 
and really undecided in what they want to do. So if we would have recruiters come and speak to the Black Student Union, maybe they can gain some interest in joining uh, the insurance industry after graduation. Yeah, for sure. I love that. It's even sometimes it's thinking outside of the box, going to clubs that maybe aren't dedicated to insurance and risk management, but to build that interest from the ground up and to kind of organically create interest in the industry. Great suggestion. I love that. Um, so for the next question, uh, I'll pose this to, to either one of you who wants to give some thoughts on it. Do you think the industry needs to take some action on the compensation front in order to attract more diverse talent? Um, I believe uh, compensation transparency is very important for anyone who is going to the job marketplace. Um, and I think companies need to be upfront about what they are willing to offer um, because, you know, people talk behind the back and it would be much worse for an employee to feel like they are being underpaid or not paid enough as much as their counterparts. So I think it is something that needs to be presented upfront. For sure. And I think that there's definitely something to be said on the topic of compensation transparency in the age of social media. We've already seen examples within the industry where social media has been used as a tool to really get that, that ball rolling and the conversation started on uh, compensation equity within the insurance industry. Um, I also think uh, just from an early careers recruiting perspective, it's it's worthwhile for companies to take a look at the competitiveness of their compensation packages, not only in regard to other insurance companies, but also in regard to other industries that college students are being recruited into. I've heard many, many stories about students and in insurance programs ending up in an in, in, in investment banking or a finance role because the compensation in other industries was more competitive. So I also think it's, it's worthwhile to sit down and look at the competitiveness of those packages, not only within against industry competitors, but also uh, at other industries as well, because it's we're competing against other industries to get students interested in insurance as well. So I, I do think that that is, is a valuable thing to look at. Jumping to another question, um, Akriti, I'll pose this to you because I think that it kind of pairs really well with uh, some things that you brought up in your discussions during the panel. Have you ever had to address a lack of diversity within a company or at an employer? And if so, what advice do you have for people that are confronting a lack of diversity in, in a, a workplace or in a, just any situation that they're experiencing? Um, so when I started my college um, working as a student worker in my university, at the term that I started in, um, I was the only person of color in the entire department. So obviously, um, Plus added on the fact that I was an international student when everyone else was from locally here. Um, it was a very non-diverse environment in a way. Um, so, you know, in such an environment, it might be difficult for the new candidate to go seek mentorship opportunities or just even have the space to ask questions um, at times. Um, but I think from company perspective, it is important that they have like a very strong training program in that way, there is a good onboarding of employees and then have a follow up with those new hires, at least for about a year or so while in the, during the onboarding process, just to make sure that even if the environment isn't much diverse, there's still like the bigger corporation who is looking after those employees. Yeah, I, I really love that response. Um, jumping to the next question, I think that both of you could probably give um, some thoughts on this. Reverse mentoring has been a really big topic that's been discussed in the industry recently. What advice would you give a senior executive who is managing young, brand new professionals? Yeah, so over the summer, I actually had the opportunity to get two tremendous mentors, um, Travis Pearson and Katie Sanchez and they were terrific they were just always available which is the number one thing and they always pointed me in the right direction and give me resources to where i could learn more about different situations um and just different topics to where i could be knowledgeable in all aspects of just approaching a new career and growing um 
Um, I would recommend uh, them to have intentional open conversations regarding the issue that they would like to know about what the youths today feel important are, or like things that they are going through. Because unless you come with that perspective, um, I don't think reverse mentorship is really going to work much. Yeah, I, I think that you hit the nail on the head right there, Kriti. Those open conversations are really important to, to understand what a, what a new professional is going through. So really having that that open conversation and breaking down those barriers. I think that a lot of times new professionals are viewed as coming in and one, having to learn everything about insurance, but also they're viewed as not having any perspective on what being a professional is like or what the workforce is like. I think that sometimes there's some bias about the professionalism of young professionals. And so I think that breaking down those internal biases that we have about what young people are like coming into the workforce and what they need to learn um, is important as well because before you break down those biases that you have for the professionalism of young people you can't even start to have a conversation about reverse mentoring so i think reverse mentoring is amazing but the first step is breaking down all of those barriers and perceptions for young people in the industry um, so kind of continuing along that same, that same path of talking about the different, the different interactions with DEI initiatives that different generations have, DEI is also important to Gen X, millennials, and even older workers. Is there something unique or different about Gen Z's interest in DEI, or is it just a, a matter of degree, a matter of our experience? Philmon, what do you think? Is there something different about Gen Z's interest in DEI within the industry? Um, I, for me personally, I would just say it's a matter of degree, like um, the person said. Um, it just goes back to our experiences and what we know and going forward. So I know for me, um, first generation American, my parents are immigrants. So um, that's something that I'm really passionate about. And um, I feel like most of the people who are already in the industry um, don't or they, they feel a certain way about it. but they don't have the level of urgency that most of um, Gen Z has towards uh, DEI. Akriti, do you have some thoughts on that? Is, is our experience with DEI different as, as Gen Z professionals? Um, I think just speaking as a Gen Z, um, I think we love self-identification and we've reached to a point where we want to define everything. So maybe our passion for how we identify ourselves could be much greater in terms of degree than compared to our older generations. Yeah, I certainly agree. And I think I think that it is it's it's a different urgency for our generation. But if you also think about the experiences that we've had as a generation, a, a lot of Gen Z workers were were 2000s kids. We weren't even around in the 90s. And so growing up all of our experiences have been defined by we're growing up in the most diverse generation that we're seeing go into the workforce yet um and i mean if we call it how it is the the insurance industry doesn't have a great history with diversity there's a lot of nepotism and a lot of lack of diversity within the industry so it's been an issue that's around and i think that our generation is one of the first generations of the insurance workforce that's going in as a completely diverse new workforce. And so I think that it's something that we kind of grew up with. It's experiences that we've been grappling with since we were kids. Uh, we grew up in an environment where DEI was much more talked about than it was in previous decades. So I do think that it's, it's a different experience because we grew up in that environment, but it's also a matter of urgency for us. Um, Akriti, I wanna, I wanna pose a question to you quickly as an international student. What, if you could just name one thing quickly what would be helpful in engaging an international student uh, for a potential new hire? Um, learning the limitations of the kinds of the jobs that companies can offer to international students, whether it is whether they're able to sponsor visa or not, or, um, or what that looks like on their end. I think that's really important to know before you even take an interview with an international student. Yeah, 100% transparency is everything. Uh, this next question makes me really excited. Uh, someone asked, uh, 
whether social media apps like TikTok and Instagram are an effective way to reach students for insurance companies. And I can go ahead and answer this one. I resounding yes for me. Uh, I think that meeting students where they are and on platforms that are natural to them is the absolute best way to to meet them where they are and to get them interested in something. I students, I mean, we don't even watch TV with commercials anymore, right? We watch streaming services. So even like maybe in the past, getting people into the industry would be like the funny insurance commercials on the TV. We're even past that. We just watch seven second TikToks on our phone. And so while that might seem silly to some older professionals, that's where we are and that's what makes sense to us. And that's where we naturally spend our time. So companies that could take steps to engage students on that apps, whether that's when you're making a marketing ad buy for your company, also buying ad space on TikTok or on Instagram. I think that that is a phenomenal step forward to engaging students and engaging Gen Z and even generations after Gen Z to get them into the industry. Um, I'll pose another question quickly. We're getting close to the end of our time. So if you could both just give quick thoughts on this. Um, as someone about to enter the workforce full time, are you looking for a formal mentoring program uh, at your future workplace? Yes, absolutely. Philmon? Yeah, I agree with I agree with the Creedy. Um, I would say it's important to also pair somebody um, with probably similar interests or someone that's relatable to them. Because looking forward into the future, they want to see where they can actually end up within the company. So having somebody that actually looks like them or has similar interests with them would probably be the best, best fit. For sure. I definitely agree that formal mentoring programs are, are amazing and absolutely essential to keeping new hires engaged. I'm going to throw a pivot in there. I agree that, that pairing someone with a mentor that has similar interests to them is important. I think that in formal mentoring programs, everyone should have two mentors. Um, that was my experience over the summer. I had someone who was paired with me that was had really similar interests to me, that was working in a similar area of the business as me. And then I had a second mentor who worked in an entirely different area of the company and had an entirely different set of interests um, for me. So even talking about diversity of thought, I think that's important. So formal mentorship programs that engage students or new professionals with someone that they see themselves in, someone that they can relate to, but also someone else in the company who's had a different experience because that's not only making that student feel included through having, or that new professional feel included through having that mentor that they can relate to that has the same experiences as them, but having that mentor with diverse, different experiences as well is increasing diversity of thought within the organization, which is, I, I think is so important as well. Um, so we're running up on the end of our time here. So that was the last question uh, that we were gonna take. But Akriti and Philmon, thank you both again for taking the time to, to be here with us today to answer live questions. And thank you to everybody out in the audience for taking the time out of your out of your afternoon, out of your busy work days to call into this. My passion is engaging students and young voices in this industry. I think it's a great industry that we should get as many Gen Zers in, into as possible. So I'm so appreciative that people took the time to call in today to send us such, such thoughtful questions. And as we continue to move forwards on this path of forging a more diverse industry for my generation and for the industry as a whole, I think it's like we mentioned back in the panel, it's important to acknowledge that these conversations aren't easy, that these things aren't uncomfortable. So just continuing to be brave on an individual level and on an organizational level to forge those better futures for diversity in the industry is how we're going to solve these, these big problems and these big challenges that we're facing. So thank you again to everyone for calling in and have a great rest of your day.